Well, my name is Dr. Tom Bad, and I'm from with the King with King University Battleship New Jersey Oral History Program. Today is September 2, 2004. We're on the Battleship New Jersey down in the medical area. Uh, and I'm speaking today with Mr. James L. Yeager, who served aboard the battleship from August 1966, the commissioning, to June, June 1970, the decommissioning, yeah. and during the Vietnam period. Uh, he served as a uh, hospital uh, corpsman, HM2. 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 Uh, and he's with us today from uh, Lake Forest, Illinois. Mr. Yeager, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome. And I might say for the historical record, several other people have helped me with the interview. One is Mr. Doug Buchanan, the education manager for the ship, and Mr. Andy Wager, uh, who helped restore this section of the ship, and he himself served aboard the USS Wisconsin as a corpsman and was a Navy veteran for 30... 26 years. 26 years. First of all, uh, Jim, start us off. How did you get to be involved? Uh, well, before we do that, let's look at some memorabilia, some artifacts okay. that you brought with us. Okay, let me just tell you, I'm very delighted to be here and be part of the program. Uh, I think this is a this is a terrific thing that you're doing, and I'm I'm just ecstatic. And anything I can do to help out with this program would be great. What I have here is maybe I should do first things first. Is a little something I brought. I dug out of my locker, Davy Jones locker. It's uh, my commissioning um, certificate from. The commissioning of 6 April 1968, where the, the, where the ship was recommissioned at the Naval Shipyard in Philadelphia, right before it was taken to its home port in Long Beach, California, uh, prior to going to Vietnam. So that's my, uh, my c uh, commissioning certificate, and uh, I promise I, that I won't be wrinkled like this. I'm getting it reframed. It happened to be with my mom and, and her locker, and uh, as I was doing all my schoolwork and m trying to get through life. So that's a very uh, important document for me. The other document I brought was uh, the decommissioning book, which I also had the honor of being on the decommissioning detail when the ship was decommissioned in uh, 17 December 1969 at the Bremerton Naval Shipyard at Puget Sound. So I'm on the commissioning detail and the decommissioning detail and technically double plank owner. So <laughs> uh, these are quite important documents uh, for me. Uh, they uh, represent a huge big piece of my life, an extremely important piece of my life, and I'm glad to share that with you. Thank you. Tell us then, how did you get to be involved with the battleship in New Jersey? What's the story behind it? Well, um, I, I don't know how far we uh, need to go back, but I was drafted in, uh, in August of 1966 into the Army. And uh, in August of 1966, I drafted right out of school from people that don't know that, uh, that they were taking people who were actually in college. And I was in my second year of college at Evansville College in Evansville, Indiana, and they drafted me. Two weeks later, I went to the Navy recruiter and said, that, can you do something? I really don't want to be in the Army. And he said, uh, sign right here, son. You joined the Navy two weeks ago. <laughs> so he informed the draft board I was in the Navy. <laughs> so that's how I got four, week, four years in the Navy instead of two years in the Army. But uh, that four years in the Navy was giving me four years of the GI Bill. That's really what I needed because I was a poor kid. So that's basically how I got into the Navy. And then I, when I got into the Navy, uh, they needed... Uh, Navy corpsmen. It was in Vietnam that we're using up a lot of corpsmen in mm -hmm. Vietnam. A lot of men were getting killed and and so they said you had college you're going to be a corpsman and that's uh, really was no choice and so at Naval Great, Great Lakes Naval Training Center at, at uh, right north of Chicago in Great Lakes, Illinois, I went through basic training, hospital corps training and then I was sent to um, Portsmouth, Virginia for uh, pharmacy technique school which I didn't attend because they asked me for two more years of my life, two and a half more years of my life. And uh, however, while I was there for about eight months, I actually went through most of the training anyway with the other candidates. And I had two years of, of uh, experience in a hospital pharmacy in Evansville, Indiana. So when I was assigned to the USS New Jersey, uh, they actually made me a pharmacy technician because I was the only one that knew anything about the pharmacy. And back up just a little bit, uh, they, they, most of the guys that came aboard the US, USS New Jersey and recommissioning were the cream of the crop. They were, they were the best boats and mates. They were the best gunners mates. They were the best uh, operation guys. 
the top guys. And I was the top guy in my hospital course school, and they asked me if I wanted to take the battleship New Jersey. I said, absolutely, I want to take the battleship New Jersey. Little bit to known that one week later they said, I asked him what was my choice if I didn't do the battleship New Jersey, and that was fleet marine training at Camp Pendleton, California, pounding the ground with the Marines. So, you know, I said, I made a good choice. <laughs> I should have gone with the Marines. Well, anyway, Corman was needed in the Marines and in the battleship, so that's how I got aboard the battleship New Jersey. Reported about February, um, March of 68, the actual commissioning uh, was the date I gave you, and, um, and then we uh, actually had to set up this sick bay, set up the pharmacy, set up everything that was in operation here, and then go out for training to get prepared to go to Vietnam. But most of the, it was about three months of shipyard work. Then it was taking the ship around the Panama Canal. And that was in June of 68 to its home port in Long Beach, California, and then uh, out for uh, sea trials before you went to Nam. That's kind of like the over history of how I got aboard the ship. You mentioned two things that are interesting for, the, for, the histor for historians. You said the crew was a select crew. It was. Uh, how did that, how was that reflected when you ultimately went, were commissioning a ship and went to sea? Uh, did this crew seem to operate better than other crews from your knowledge at the time? I, uh, well, I had not been aboard the ship, a ship before, so I didn't have any reference there. But the others who had been aboard several ships uh, uh, and were more career uh, uh, military men had indicated to me that this, this crew was a Cracker Jack crew. They all were experienced. Uh, sailors, they 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 knew the operation from top to bottom, and so there was not any uh, a lot of technical training for most of those guys. I'm sure some of the new guys like me had to had to learn some of the shipboard routine, but I would say three quarters of those uh, top people were all very experienced sailors, and I believe the chief boatswain was also a the chief boatswain's boatswain aboard this ship in Korea. So he was extremely experienced as a battleship sailor. What was the name of the chief boatswain? Uh, you know, I can't remember his name, but uh, he, was, uh, he was a good guy, very uh, crusty old guy, but he was, he was, I believe, aboard the Korean uh, uh, conflict. Now, when you came below for the first time into the medical area in the pre-commissioning period, what did you find down here? What was it like? When we first came aboard, I think I was probably, I, we all sort of came aboard at the same time. It wasn't like a whole lot of people were ahead of us. All of the, the hospital corpsmen and the chief was, they came aboard at the same time. What we found was that the place had been uh, cleaned and freshly painted, but there were no supplies put away. No one did anything that you would, that would call get it ready to accept a patient. Uh, there were uh, actually no drugs aboard, there were no uh, uh, surgical instruments aboard, there was, there was not much there. What we had to do was then go out and requisition, first of all get the place what we would call hospital clean, so clean it from top to bottom, make sure that, uh, that the, all the, the uh, electrical, all the lights, all of the, all, everything was functional, and then we actually had to go out and stock up the, uh, the goods. So I, re I remember very vividly having to write 6505 on, uh, on these little requisition chits, and 6505 is a drug, <laughs> so it's 6505, one bottle of aspirin, 100 count, one each, <laughs> and how many lines of that I had to write to, to requisition all of the drugs that we needed aboard the ship, and, and then other guys did the surgical instruments and everything else, but then that, that came aboard, we stocked the ship, and then we went through some of our own drills on how to accept the patient of what we were going to do before we actually got into uh, uh, involved in how we would accept how we would do emergencies. But so we had to had to kind of gel and have a little bit of a you know it's just like any kind of other uh, position where you have to get together. Was this area updated in any way when it was uh, recommissioned and uh, working on the recommission in 1968? Actually, they they did not. There was really no updating, and, and as we come around, I'll tell you what was not here. I believe, and only updating, I believe that the x-ray machine was an updated x-ray machine. Um, and I can't even remember if it even had one, but it was an updated x-ray machine. Uh, we had uh, updated uh, uh, OR tables. 
But other than that, the space was not remodified at all. It was as it was in Korean conflict and World War II. So, so we walk around later on and point some of this out to us changes that were made in the 1980s during the second part of the interview. I will. Most of everything I just had a brief look around looks uh, very close to being the same. Talk to us a little bit about your experiences now as a pharmacist made aboard the ship. What did you do? What would your daily routine be like? What were some of the cases you worked on? Well, what uh, my daily, of course, like in all military, there's duty. So the people who, who ha have the duty actually are, that's mostly re referred to as after hours, but everybody is on deck for muster in the morning. So you have to get up and the three S's, which we won't tell the first one, but you know, you have to get up in the morning, get ready, and come down here. And uh, most everyone expects that the corpsman to be impeccably clean and, and neat, and generally that's what you, you, you try to portray, because you also have medical officers that, are, that insist on that too. So as a complement of corpsmen, we were all mustered down here at about, uh, oh, 7, 7.15 generally. We kind of got a little bit early because sick call was at, at 8 o'clock. So we had to get all down here together. And uh, the routine would be in the morning, they would be sick call. Uh, you've heard this one before. So sick call, anybody that was sick, ill, needed medical attention came down. And we ran those guys through. Most of it was headaches, colds, uh, uh, you know, bangs. Uh, something not right uh, with them uh, and it was all mostly minor stuff. There was a few infections but when you have 1500 men that's like a small city so you're going to have a revolving type of, of medical condition. A lot of it initially while we were before we went out was a whole lot of cuts and bruises because there are people having to get used to the ship, people doing a lot of work, a lot of physical work. So a lot of smashed hands and things like that and, and hurt ankles. Well, sick call would last for about uh, an hour. And after sick call, then we would go through routine. We'd either take tests um, or we'd have guys come back for tests and we'd have to go through various routines of, of, uh, of testing these guys that, that we came back. Some of it would be lab tests. My job was to dispense medicine. And if we didn't have medicine, then I would have to make sure that we got it here either from from the ship's stores or from uh, from the stores aboard the uh, uh, base, or I'd have to have it specially sent in here. So that was basically my job. There were um, uh, that's a general routine, and then um, they would also we would also have a an afternoon sick call at about one one thirty. And that would be an afternoon sick call. And that would just usually be for, again, the routine things or bring guys back to, to see how, uh, how they were. Most of it was training and training for prepared to be on station when we actually got to a war zone. And that was what we're going to do with a, uh, a serious injury. How we were we going to perform surgery? Uh, how would things work? And a lot of this had to be done. There was also a ton of paperwork of uh, administrative paperwork and I think most of the corpsmen just hated that but you had to have all these medical records and you had to review those carefully because I was in charge of the immunizations and so what I had to do is I had to stack up and I had to read all the immunizations and I had to prepare these guys for going into Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia there's a certain set of immunizations and some of them are not you got plague you got yellow fever and and these are tough ones besides you would get gamma globulin shots. And this is a huge, this is about two uh, cc's of, of, of stuff in each rump. And, uh, and so everyone had to get that for mononucleosis or other hepatic diseases. And that, uh, that was probably the worst one plus yellow fever. So uh, there was a, a whole bit of administrative things that had to be done to prepare for immunizations as well as for being on station in Before Vietnam. Before the interview uh, started on tape, you talked to us about one officer who didn't want to get his shots because you're reading re Yeah, this, well, this was a good one. I, yeah, well, I, th there's a couple, I'll give you a couple of preambles because there is, it is true that the bigger they come, the harder they fall. We had a hu some huge guy, we had one big, huge boatswain mate that absolutely when, when I went to give his shots, and this guy had arms as big as my leg, he was literally dripping with sweat. And I felt so bad about it. I, actually, I took him in here. 
and I set him down and said, you've got to be really calm here because I, you know, I don't want you to faint out there. He sat down here completely white, almost where I'm sitting now. And, and before he knew it, as I was patting him on the arm, I actually gave him the shots. So he didn't even know I gave it to him. <laughs> but that was, one, that was kind of one anecdote. That's the only one. I never had anybody faint on me. But we, at that time also, we had this, uh, we had, we, uh, this uh, powered gun. And we had to pump it. It wasn't CO2. We had to, we had to pump it ourselves, and then we had to give the guy a shot. And, uh, and it just so happens that uh, the big guys are OK. A little skinny guy, though, if he'd moved just a little bit, that thing would just that would cut. And boy, that would hurt. Oh, man, that was bad. Anyway, that was anecdotal. We had one guy, it was, a, it was, a, it was an ensign. He was an officer that, that um, argued with us that he did not have, and we don't argue with officers, so he said, no, I already had my shots for Southeast Asia. I had a yellow fever, and I had a plague. Well, his records didn't indicate that. So uh, we had to go, we went to our medical officer, and he started really arguing with our medical officer, who was a commander at that time, and a rank. But you know, medical officers are a little bit easier going. They don't start pulling rank on you. Well. Uh, that sort of ticked off our medical officer extremely. So he went to the captain, as he said he did, and I, I, I assume he did, that was Captain Snyder at the time, and the next thing I know, our medical officer was escorting this young ensign back down and getting the shot, not from me. He was getting it directly from the medical officer in probably the, not the most delicate manner, I would say. <laughs> So that is, that's the anecdotal information for that uh, our, I, I don't know if I mentioned the medical officer's name, but anyway, that's exactly what happened to that one incident. Who was the medical officer? Uh, the, the head medical officer was J.J. Uh, Quinn. And the assistant medical officer? Well, uh, uh, Denby. His name was uh, Denby, D-E-N-B-Y. A good guy. Once you're in, off the coast of Vietnam, on duty, can we go to there now? Uh, Talk about some of the uh, work that you did down here uh, while you're on a firing line actually supporting our troops. There, uh, while you're actually on a firing line uh, shooting, uh, there's, you're either in a, um, uh, a combat ready state or you're either in that or general quarters. Most of the time we're in combat ready state shooting. So you never stand still shooting, you're actually moving. When this ship's in moving in an operation and shooting, you have a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of things. Uh, uh, you know, they're hoisting shells. They're, they're, in, they're in their combat mode. There are, of course, the, the cooks are back there cooking, and the, 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 uh, the guys in the engine room are taking care of the engines and, and, and people running the ship. But there is a lot more guys in activity, so there's a whole lot more accidents. And and, uh, and, and various kinds of things that, that, that take place on the firing But mostly, the, most accidents are happening during that time. So you're moving, and we are actually taking anybody that comes into the door uh, for whatever need that they, they have. Uh, some guys are actually exhausted. They might faint. They're down in the powder room where there's actually some ether down there, and they get, they get sick. A lot of guys are just injuring themselves, so there's too much injury. So during that time, our activity is, it, most everybody is right here in the sick bay uh, because it's just almost a steady stream of guys coming in with problems. What's the, why is there ether in the powder room? Well, uh, they, uh, because I think that was, the powder uh, was stored in, in canisters, and the canisters were packed with ether, and that was to keep it stabilized, they say. But ether is explosive in itself. It's a little bit of ether. But you can smell that ether when you're down there. Talk to us a little bit about some of the injuries that you worked on uh, down here when people are firing their, the guns, five inch or 16 inch guns, or whatever happens during the combat situation. They, um, OK, when, um, when, when they come back, when uh, most of the injuries, I would say, are finger smashes, head cuts, um, uh, hand smashes, but there was one particular incident, I believe that's already recorded by several people, uh, where the, uh, uh, a, uh, a young, uh, could have been a bosomator, whomever was, what he, what he was stationed in, in uh, got caught in a, um, in a powder uh, hoist or uh, a turret around and really crushed his, crushed his hip, crushed his legs. Uh, these were compound fractures, a lot of, uh, lot of blood. A lot of injury there. This guy was uh, in very bad shape, 
Uh, and that was during one of the firing runs. And I can't remember exactly when it was, but I thought it was in the first three months when we were actually in North Vietnam. We were above the DMZ doing this. And um, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Denby, who was a vascular surgeon uh, from Springfield, Illinois. And he uh, actually performed surgery right here on this uh, operating table for several hours. And I, I think it was at least over six hours with our operating room technicians and anybody else could help because he had lost this, this uh, young sailor had lost a lot of blood. And actually, Dec uh, Captain Snyder had to take the ship out. He took the ship offline and kept the ship steady while the surgery was taking place. If it hadn't been for the doctor, it hadn't been for the circumstance, or especially Dr. Denby, uh, this, this boy would have been dead. It was a very, very bad injury. So that was the worst one, and we had to carry him off with a body cast a few days later in Medivacum. And I remember the, some, it was about four huge, the biggest guys we could have on the ship, carried him in three-quarter body cast right out the door to your left, all the way up aft in the ship, and, uh, and uh, into uh, a helicopter to Medivacum. But um, that was uh, probably the worst injury. There had been other broken bones. There had to been other cuts and lacerations. Uh, Dr. Denby showed me how to do a cut down. He showed me how to do uh, some minor surgery so I could take care of most of this stuff. Otherwise, these guys would be up all night. Tell us what you mean by a cut down. Well, you know, a cut down is when a, when a uh, patient is in, is in uh, shock. You can't get a needle in his vein to give him IV solutions. And you need to give him IV to b expand his blood volume. Otherwise, he'll die in, in a state of shock, especially if there's any blood loss. So you have to cut into the skin, down into an artery or vein, and most likely it's a vein, but you can't even find the veins, and actually put uh, the needle into the vein. So that's, way, that's how you have to do that. This is known for people in trauma uh, and sometimes in operating rooms. They, if you can't get a vein, they actually have to perform surgery to go down in to get that vein so that you can expand the, the, the blood volume in the guy. Otherwise, he dies and dies of shock, and, and, and it can come fairly fast, too. So this is uh, common what you learn how to do when you're a fleet marine corpsman, too, because you're in combat situations and most guys that get injured out there are in shock. So uh, I think mo I can say most of it was humdrum routine. Every now and then we had pockets of excitement. And usually when we're on the firing line, the, the, the injuries would come, cuts, slashes, burns. Uh, we had a couple of bad burns from the guys down in the uh, engine room, you know, would touch things. And, but these were not uh, life-threatening injuries. We only had, I think, one that I remember, and that was that one. Did you take care of any uh, sh troops ashore in Vietnam, Marines, Army troops? When we, were in, when we were in North Vietnam, and I think a little bit later, too, I, I remember, uh, yes, we brought, the, we brought Marines aboard. Now, I can't remember. Some of them came aboard in a helicopter. I, some could have come aboard in a boat. Most of those guys, though, were not uh, shot. They, were, they had uh, mostly exposure injuries, some of them uh, a little jungle rot. Uh, guys were, had been out uh, in the bush for some time. And I believe the first three months we had taken these guys off, they were actually in North Vietnam uh, above the uh, DMZ. They, uh, some of them were just exhausted. We brought them down here and we treated them and we had a couple of them stay for a few days, just completely exhausted. And I remember uh, looking at one of the guy's feet uh, it was, uh, it was uh, very close to being gangrene. Um, it was just the worst looking feet I'd ever seen. And the guy had been out in the jungle and, you know, what, what can you expect? Do you know which unit these Marines were from? Which you, division? Third you, division? You know, I can't remember. I can't remember. It was definitely the, the division. What's the top one? Oh, was it I-Corps? I-Corps. I-Corps. Third division was up. Along exactly. It was that one. And they, those were the ones that were sent up above the DMZ at the time. Well, it was, I don't even think they called it the DMZ. I think they just, it w wasn't there. It was in North Vietnam, that's for sure. And so that was really our only encounter with, Mar Marines came on and off, but that was the only encounter taking them from the shore. We were not set up as a hospital ship. We were set up just as a ship to support uh, the 1,500 and, uh, men aboard this ship. Any other experiences that you want to tell us about while you're aboard the ship off of Vietnam that you think are important? Well, I think as I, you know, uh, as I go down through my memory uh, for some years ago, there um, uh, I remember camaraderie 
with our everybody aboard the ship was pretty tight. Battleship sailors are kind of tight. Anyway, it's a it's a very good it's you know it's it's an elite duty. Uh, I remember uh, mostly uh, mostly routine medical things, you know, in-house type injuries. Uh, I only remember the one very serious injury we had. Uh, I remember also having to go up to uh, the way up to the top of the con and uh, take a look at a sick guy who was supposed to be on a sound pardon phone up there, uh, who I had to uh, wade through a little vomit because <laughs> this was in this uh, typhoon. And I, I pro you probably already had this in history, but as we were heading to Vietnam, uh, or to Hawaii, we really got into a monster typhoon. I can't remember it was off the coast of Hawaii, but that caused about a million dollars worth of damage aboard the ship. That was probably the most memorable experience because you wouldn't have been sitting where you were and I wouldn't be sitting where we were. We would be sliding across this deck. Those waves were coming up very close to number two turret. They were over number one turret. The whole bow of the ship was underwater. We were really in a tough uh, situation and probably the guys like uh, Captain Snyder could remember that vividly because he was probably up there on the uh, on the on the con. He was in, in charge of the the ship, obviously. But I remember being down here, rocking and rolling in that uh, in that typhoon, and you actually couldn't do anything. You couldn't you couldn't do anything. You just had to strap yourself in. This was a this was a tough place did, to be. Did you get many seasick cases? We got quite a few. You know, I never got seasick in my whole life. It was kind of like a roller coaster ride. But we got quite a few guys who were absolutely uh, bedridden because of seasick, seasickness when we, we brought them down here. That was another experience. I, uh, I, I don't want to skip around here, but in, uh, in uh, a, a Christmas, you know, we had uh, a Bob Hope come aboard. And uh, that was a, let's see, Bob Hope, Roosevelt Greer, um, uh, let me, uh, Anne Margaret, um, that was a good one, you know. <laughs> Anne Margaret came down uh, here, uh, and Rosie Greer too. Uh, Anne Margaret had a little chest code. And, <laughs> and you had to take care of it. <laughs> this is the truth. <laughs> the people are reading this, looking at this, are going to say, no, this is not right. Uh, no, she actually. Anne Margaret was an actress. Yeah, Anne Margaret. Uh, well endowed, perhaps. A well endowed actress. She had a lot of freckles. She was fairly petite. Uh, but uh, act actually a gorgeous, uh, well-endowed uh, woman. And of course, for a sailor that's been out to sea about six months, well, you know, let me tell you, you know, your eyes start to wonder. Nevertheless, she came down and uh, she did have a little chest code. She had been out doing uh, uh, shows one right after another and uh, did, did come down here. So we, we actually gave her a little uh, 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 medicine to kind of clear her throat and clear her lungs up, uh, but it was she was a real delightful person. I believe there was another lady called Linda Bennett. Linda, B was her Bennett? Uh, which I I can't remember what no what was her name? Uh, Linda something. She was Miss World. Uh, uh, another uh, good place to put your eyes at that time, and but they Bob Hope did a heck of a good job. He basically had a tremendous uh, uh, Christmas show right above right up here on number two tour. How did the men receive that show? Oh, they, I mean, it was absolutely uh, uh, the thing that we needed to do. Because here you were, away from home, on the firing line, and actually we just came off the firing line and to set up for the show. So they, I think, most people don't understand how valuable Bob Hope and his troop was to those people who were looking for a little bit of home. It was terrific. You mentioned that during this typhoon you hit, you had a million dollars of damage. Do you recall some of the major damage that was caused? Uh, yeah, there were hatches, hatches, uh, railings, uh, uh, things like that. I remember I was looking at one hatch when we, I believe we got into, I think it was Yokosuka, Japan, uh, where we were going from, yeah, that's right now, we were going from uh, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii to Yokosuka, Japan, and we got into that typhoon. And that, it was a biggie. and, and Walking around the outside of the ship and seeing how that some of the hatches were just caved in by by the water, and these are not uh, light hatches; these are big, sturdy uh, uh, metal hatches, and they were just like dented in like a like a, like a some somebody just took a big hammer and banged into it. But that was uh, 
that was what I remember. There was also some, uh, quite a bit of damage on some of the infrastructure up at the top, uh, radar, uh, things that turned around, all of those other things that go up to the top were, were also affected. And so we had to have some repairs there at the uh, Yakuska shipyard for some time. I can't remember how long we were there before we actually went on station in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam War by 68 and especially by 69 was not a popular war any longer. What was the uh, men's reaction to the war? They heard news from home and so on like that. What was the, again, the, the crew's sense of itself as they're participating in the Vietnam War? You know, th it's a very interesting question because um, I think a lot of people who uh, may be watching me now uh, in 2004 may not understand that some of the uh, we didn't have as much rapidity and much uh, instantaneous news uh, in 68. It was a lot different in 69. So most of the men were not getting daily, daily news bulletins. We were not really privy to all the protests going back home unless somebody got a newspaper someplace. But it's not, today we're in this minute by minute news cycle. There you might get a glimpse of it, but you weren't, in, you weren't really uh, into it. We, did, we weren't into what the new songs were coming out. We, we had no idea what the new car looked like. Unless somebody told us, we didn't know what the sports scores were. You know, today it's all instant. We, uh, so when, when we were learning anything about a protest, we got it kind of scrubbed and only a little bit that there were protests from Vietnam War. But we were so busy doing our job we didn't have time to think about why are we over here. We had a job to do, and this is why the, most of the guys were all, most of the ones that I knew, uh, had been uh, drafted uh, from, from in, uh, uh, in boot camp and in hospital corps school. Of course, when we got aboard the ship, I would say about 50% of them were draftees and 50% of them were career people. They all were conscious, uh, uh, dedicated people, and didn't really, no one really I had conversations about war protest. I think it because one, they were dedicated, they did their job, and we didn't have this instantaneous pound me with news every day. I think that would be a that would be a big detriment that anybody would have to go through. I don't know how the men today are doing this. As we said now, the men in Iraq, uh, that would I think that would might weigh on them. Uh, somebody told me that I think when you're going over towards Hawaii, near Hawaii, one of the men jumped over the ship, committed suicide. Did, did, yeah. that, did you hear about that? Is that an actual event? That, that is an actual event. Um, now, what? Uh, I can't remember how many, but I was, uh, I do know that we had to follow up on it in sickbay, and there was uh, someone who was not accounted for who w definitely went aboard off the ship, and we don't know exactly um, why that was the case. Um, we, were, uh, we were told that it was one of those McNamara boys and uh, you know I don't know if you uh, understood that McNamara actually made the US Navy take a certain amount of draftees that would not normally be qualified for the US Navy. I can't remember what the Navy had but they had a cutoff on the Armed Force Qualification Test which was not that, that difficult of a test but the Navy had a cutoff uh, the Marines had a cutoff, the Air Force had a cutoff, Army took just about anybody, but I think they even had a cutoff. But I, I, I was told that the McNamara boys were boys that were, couldn't even qualify in the Army. Now, if you score a 10 or 20 on the Armed Force examination test out of 100, it's not, you just don't know your left shoe from your right shoe. You're just not all that well endowed with intelligence. And uh, we had to take those by order of McNamara. I remember the conversation from our medical officer indicating that uh, Captain Snyder was not too happy about having to bring those guys aboard the elite battleship. But we took some, and, uh, and I remember, uh, uh, I believe one of them, or two of them, uh, did jump ship, and one of them going to Hawaii, and I think one from Hawaii to Vietnam. Some, I'm not sure if that's from why into Vietnam was a guy from the McNamara squad. And also, I remember also that a group of them got together and said they were homosexual. And uh, that, I think, absolutely infuriated everybody. And of course, that gave uh, Dr. I think uh, Captain Snyder a, a reason to get him off the ship. And I know that there was four or five of them got evac'd 
a fast. So they're using uh, their self-accusation of homosexuality as a way to get out of the ship. Way, the way to get off the ship, and I believe that that was the uh, group of them was, I don't know if all of them, but some of them were the, quote, McNamara boys. Everybody knew them. As, as some of them turned out to be uh, okay guys that could follow uh, orders and holy stone the deck. But I remember the chief boatswain and, and a couple of other boatswains. I knew a few gunners, mates, and boatswains. And, they, you know, <laughs> they... They were telling me that they just couldn't, they tried to get these guys where they wouldn't have to get into an, any important position, you know. We never let them uh, touch a projectile, never let them do anything that required mechanical movement. So, I remember that. Federal Recruiting District, Philadelphia, departing. Great. Well, anyway, that was, that was, a, that was kind of like an antidote, but I'm sorry to digress, but nevertheless, that was, that, 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 that people on a board of battleship, think of themselves as elite. They are good. They are, they, everybody knows their job. And you can imagine how much of an insult it was to have to take guys that just didn't cut the mustard. Just, just to clarify something, you said probably one, at least one and probably two men jumped jump overboard. That's correct. And I believe that there was got to be an official record. I know that because we, we had to document it in, uh, in the sick bay. Um, one other issue I'm interested in is, uh, is um, the issue of diversity in the Navy, how it changed from World War II up to the present day. Uh, the crew by the 60s was starting to be integrated. Uh, how did things work on the ship? Did, were people friendly with each other, different uh, ethnic racial backgrounds? Was there conflict? There was conflict in the Navy at the time, in the Marines and so on like that. What do you recall from that situation? You know, I, I can tell you, I think we were probably uh, saved by the fact that they put the best of the best aboard this ship. Uh, we had uh, all different uh, races and nationalities that I know of, you know, from the stewards who were mostly Filipino to uh, guys that were career, um, guys that, 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 that some of them, with a couple of them were American Indians, black, uh, just about any, everyone that, that I could think of. We really did not have many uh, conflicts other than what you would normally find from a bunch of guys cooped up together for eight months. But there was really no racial thing. There was a few guys that had a couple chips on their shoulders, but most of them were not, we just didn't have any conflicts aboard the ship. A lot of my guys that I went out and drank with uh, were uh, black. They were decent guys. And uh, a lot of the career people that we knew here were decent guys. Uh, you could count on them. I, I, we just didn't have any aboard this ship. So I know that there was on the, in the field and uh, in, the, in the Marine Corps, maybe even the Army, but we didn't have it here. Talk to me a little bit about your, uh, your officers. How did you react to your officers? Did you respect them? Were they professional? Did they treat you fairly? Yes, I, I, you know, I think that's another one too. I think most of the officers were top class except for that one guy that was an ensign but he obviously he was a greenie most of the peop most of the officers that we had were uh had had commands aboard a naval vessel they were all sharp um, top class there was no officer that ever that i would say that ever was uh, a, a problem that i heard about uh, one thing about being in the sick bay i mean for the people who are re looking at this you get to know more about the ship than most others because any kind of a problem comes through sick bay one way or another and, and unless it was some sort of an isolated fight but if, you know if, if it's an is, is an isolated fight you find out about it because their black eye their cut or whatever comes through the ship so that's how why corpsmen usually know what the pulse of the ship is so but i can tell you we had top class officers there was and it has to do with the with the Stop, starting with uh, J.J. Quinn, or no, our, our particular medical officer, which is a, he was a, he was a career officer and a medical doctor and a, a good guy. He had his quirks, but he was a good guy and fair guy. And the junior officer was also a fair guy, Th those immediate officers. Captain Snyder obviously was probably one of the best uh, uh, captains that, that I had worked under uh, in my four years of the Navy. He was he was really a good guy. Why do you say that? What made him well, a good I captain? think I think because he demanded a lot from his uh, junior officers, and he he really wanted to have a top class ship. He he was paid attention to the details that were were on a ship, 
uh, uh, following another ship that I was on, you never saw the, the commanding officer, never wanted even to, to see who you were, never even came down to, to talk to you, never took a tour of the sick bay, never, never bothered uh, Captain Snyder did. So I think that, that he, was, he was concerned about his, his sailors and knowing that what we were going into, you just couldn't make mistakes. And again, we were battleship sailors. You, you expe you, things are, are different. You know, I, I, I don't want to denigrate a supply ship, but it's not a supply ship. It's a line ship. So that, that and, and he, he made us feel that way. Did Captain Snyder uh, often come down to the medical area? He did. He did. Saw him a lot. Saw him quite a bit. I, and he was, he was, he usually made a rounds just about everywhere. Captain Snyder was all over this ship. Day and night or just day? I can't remember. I really can't. It's been some time. But, um, so I, um, in, um, I'm trying to go back and to, to answer one of your other questions. Are there any other highlights of uh, the ship um, uh, trying to, um, uh, trying to uh, resupply the ship in bad weather? That was a pretty tough one. Uh, there we had quite a bit of injuries during that. That's one ship comes on alongside of another one. Trying to land a helicopter several times in the rough seas, which never got accomplished. Uh, uh, those, that, that's the ones I remember. Um, I don't want to, uh, to say too many bad things, but you know, uh, one week after Liberty is always a very tough one. <laughs> well, as a corpsman, uh, you know, you see every, every medical condition. And so you can imagine going on shore after being, well, let me just tell you that our first line, I, I, you know, history will have to correct me, but I remember us being out on the line for about 60 straight days. That means you're firing, moving for 60 days, and then I think we went back to uh, Subic Bay, Philippine Islands, which at the time we had a naval base, and to, for, for resupply and a little bit of R&R. &R. And we did this off and on. So it was about 60 days. And some, one time I think we were out 70 days. 60, 70 days at sea can do wonderful things to a you know, young, testosterone, uh, pumped up guy. So when you get aboard uh, uh, the base and the Subic Bay, Philippines, there's very much ample opportunity to um, enjoy one's uh, sexual prowess. And as a corpsman, about seven to 10 days after you go back out to sea, certain things start to happen if you have been in the wrong environment. Uh, gonorrhea, syphilis, uh, and just nonspecific urethritis, which are, you know, you are infections that are tough to go with. Well, we would have them lined up around that turret out there, maybe 30 or 40 uh, coming in with things like, I think I've got this little discharge from my uh, private part. Uh, can you help me out? So. Uh, that's, uh, that's part of coming back from Liberty. Most of those guys had gonorrhea. I think we had one or two syphilis cases, but one or two gonorrhea. Now here's, a, here's an interesting, I just remembered something. Uh, one of the McNamara boys, as I explained to you before, they weren't too bright. And uh, the first time we went back to the Subic Bay, uh, this guy came in with gonorrhea. I know because I shared, the pharmacy shared the, the space with uh, Wally Eyed, who was the lab tech, and Wally uh, looked under there, and it was one. It was the first time we came back from Sui Bay. He said, "Wow, look at this!" So I went looked at under the microscope, and what you can see is these little gram-negative uh, diplococci appearing intra and extracellular. It's gonorrhea. So he's one of our first cases, and we treated him with antibiotics. Okay, and a few others. We won't go into and enlisted and officers, so uh, you know, we, we'll kind of be balanced here. Uh, so we went back out to sea, about another 70 days. Come back another 70 days, guess who was first in line? Same guy. And we were saying, didn't we tell you that you really need to use a prophylactic if you're going to do this, better not do it again. You know, this is not really good. This is a, this is a bad case. And some of these cases are hard to cure. And he was telling me, he says, well, you know, Doc, I went back to her and she said she was clean this time. <laughs> and you know what? I really love her. 
All right, okay, so we take care of you. All right, one more time. Another time, out at sea for another 60 days, came back, Subic Bay, and here he was again. And, she, and I said, don't tell me. He said, yeah, but she promised this time that she had gotten antibiotics. Promised me. How could this happen? I said, well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're not going to show her again. <laughs> so it, this is a true story. It's a, it's a true story, but I thought you might kind of like this little anecdotal story about how these how some of these guys uh, really weren't prepared for what was hitting them at Subic Bay, which is a Wild West town, by the way. Uh, to move off of anecdote, what percent of the crew would pick up these various forms of social diseases when they would land at Subic Bay? Okay, well, the crew was 1550, right? So I would say we had about 30, 30 cases every time we came back of gonorrhea. Uh, and probably another 10 or 20 of nonspecific urethritis, which is not exactly gonorrhea. It's basically dirty bugs. You know, these are gram-positive bugs. These are different kinds of bugs. But probably the worst case to have is the nonspecific urethritis. As a matter of fact, one guy we had to hospitalize. These things get to be very, very nasty infections. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't let him off the ship when he got back after Vietnam because he was in bad shape. I mean, this thing keeps recurring. So I would say, well, 30, 30 to 40 each time out of 1550 is not bad. That's pretty. Which was Subic Bay considered one of the more infected air, uh, areas to go uh, to on leave in the Pacific uh, area or Yakuska, Iwakuni? Well, Tom. That's a good loaded question. I, I said to you before the, the tape started to roll, Supic Bay was just one big bacteria waiting to attack you. I mean, that when you went from the base across the river, which we always called Shit River, uh, because you would have to look down and that would, that would tell you what that river was, the, the stench of the whole city would be horrible. And you can imagine, I mean, guys would go over there and you know if they weren't drinking alcohol beverage which I, I wish they would because that would kill it anything else reminded me of one big bacteria and the ship usually had to contribute to uh, shore leave so I had to go over and stand by the uh, the uh, shore patrol station uh, as part of my duty and I hated that duty because there, there you know all the cuts and bangs and drunks and everything would come in but let me tell you uh, I guess gonorrhea is probably just one of the mild things you could get. Guys would get robbed, stabbed. It was a Wild West town. Tom, it had, it, if you ever seen the good, bad, and the ugly with Clint Eastwood? Well, that's what the town reminded me was. It was dirt streets and, and the wood sidewalks for the most part. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it was bad news. I, I just, I told guys don't even go over there, but you know, you can't. It was, couldn't stop those guys. And then every now and then, though, we would go up to uh, Baguio City. I got a helicopter ride up to Baguio, uh, up to the top, uh, to, uh, what was that, uh, Clark? Clark Air Force. The one, the one that got wiped out by Mount Pinatubo. That was, a, that was a beautiful area up there. But you never want to take the bus up there, because uh, you talk about a, a, a ride and a half, that bus going up that narrow road, forget that. But that was a, that was a beautiful area. To change the conversation a bit, what, how, um, I've heard about different roles on a ship. Some men had better jobs than others. Was your work as a pharmacist made considered a good job to have on the ship? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, as a pharmacist, uh, well, as a pharmacist made, or even as a corpsman, a corpsman was a, a, it was a good duty. A corpsman is a guy that you want to love or you want to hate, but corpsmen usually were, first of all, they were more, better educated and better trained. Corpsman, electronic technique school, anyone who had gone to an advanced schooling, in the Navy had something. And, and as a corpsman, you, I, I guess you couldn't, you, you ne didn't necessarily have to be smart, but if you went on to be an OR tech, an x-ray tech, a pharmacy tech, these required more extensive training and much higher scores. You had to do special testing to get into those fields. So it was considered the mo one of the most elite jobs on the ship, aside from uh, the electronics or uh, uh, maybe some of the gunnery things down in, uh, in the CAC, the command centers. Somebody told me that to be a cook on a ship was a good job because you always got to wash when water would be short. <laughs> was that true also in your position? We had, we had some times where we had short water uh, 
But you know, you, you, you know about the Navy shower. You go in, you turn the shower on, you get wet, you, you, you lather up, then you turn the shower off and wash off. If you dilly-dally around, the, guy, the next guy is going to be uh, complaining. So a lot of the young guys who were sort of like polywogs on a ship but didn't understand this, sometimes when they showered, they got their self soaped up, other guys would pull them right out. And so, <laughs> so spending the day with soap on you wasn't a fun way to do it. So you learn very fast that you have to do a Navy shower. Now being a corpsman is almost like being a cook. You know, everybody likes to cook. You don't want to make the cook mad, do you? You don't want to make the corpsman mad because you might need them. But also, we also had our own showers. If we, you know, we, we could have a, a hotel shower if we really wanted. We never did it, but we could. So it was, we had really good duty in terms of what the other guys were doing. Uh, it wasn't manual labor. We didn't have to holy stone the decks or anything like that. This was, a, this was called a very top class duty. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the Vietnam uh, tour of duty? Any experiences, remembrances you think are important? Uh, I think I'm going through a lot. Of, I remember, uh, let's just talk about the, a couple of things aboard the ship uh, that you know, some, are, some are fun and some aren't. Uh, one, when the ship is in firing line, I told you a lot of things happen, a lot of people moving, a lot of accidents happen. And uh, I've been out on the deck and see a nine-gun salvo uh, go off or even a three-gun salvo and if you just look out over the horizon, you'll see those shells, which are 2,000 pounds, going out over the horizon. And you just wonder sometimes who's on the other end of those things. Those are powerful. I remember kind of a majestic beauty of a clear blue sky, a beautiful blue ocean, and whoom, these salvos that were shooting at a country that we didn't really know, I didn't know and looking at the white sandy beaches and I actually thought I said my god you know I can see Hilton hotels here I can see I can see resorts this is gorgeous I mean and uh, what in the heck how would people get so crazy to cause this to have their country sh being shot at that was a couple of images even when we went to South Vietnam one of the uh, sometimes out at night or even when we were way out at sea you never want to do it too close you might get shot I, I think we took a little small arm fire at some time and not to digress I believe there's a couple times we took a couple motors and there was a there was some MIGs that were coming after us that got shot down I can't remember if they we were in North Vietnam or not but I'm sure there's other people can recall that history but I do know we went to general quarters for real and I remember that was a scary circumstance because my job was in the after battle dressing station and when you go down a couple of ladders and they put this huge big 16 inch steel door down Vroom, and turn it, it's like a tomb. And you're down there for whatever happens, better or worse. And it's really, really scary. <laughs> Especially in when you don't know what's going to happen. We had no idea that the MiGs were coming after us. So we went to general quarters, I think, for real a couple times. So that's another image. And then, and then the image at, at, uh, at night, again, watching uh, the jet aircraft drop bombs on particular positions was an, another uh, an image I have uh, other than uh, other than the good images which are talking about the, the Christmas show the camaraderie we had uh, uh, the the uh, the coming in back into Hawaii Yokosuka Japan I really took a lot of time going to historical uh, uh, places and believe it or not I didn't even I didn't bother working going through the brothels you know I was I was more interested in history and then I was, I was actually a history major when I was uh, in my, when they drafted me out of college. So I was interested in history and went to the Great Buddha of Kamakura and the Tower of Tokyo and Mount Fujiyama and those types of things to, to, to bolster my history. So those are good images and I'm sure some of them will pop back in my head. How did the Japanese people receive you when you were walking outside of Yakuska? Yeah, um, Fairly well. I remember. Let me just tell you. One of the one of my good friends was was stationed at Yokosuka. He was an uh, OR tech, um, and um, Wetzel was his name. He is, he was married, and he actually lived off base. And uh, I remember that I had to go uh, toward Kamakura, and at that time there was no. Uh, you get on a train. There's no. It's no English. Today in Tokyo, you got. You got some English there so you can figure out where to go. There was no English. I think I got off, I got off the train right, 
but I had no idea. There was, I was supposed to get a bus, and I was just standing there in my white hat. I was just looking out, how am I, God's name, going to figure this out? There were two little girls came up and said, pointing to that bus. And I said, oh, 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 is that the bus I take? He said, yeah, you take that bus. And, and they didn't say that in English. You just take the bus. So, okay, I got on the bus. And I got off the bus. I know it's supposed to get off at three stops. Three stops later, I got off the bus and was right there by my friend's house. So they knew that this other guy, also with a white hat, lived in that one spot. So I would say I was treated very well from that experience. And I, uh, there was another great experience when you go down to the equator and you become a shellback from polywog to shellback. Uh, that's a great experience. I'm sure they've seen the ships. Um, have you seen the ship's um, uh, yearbooks? The ship's yearbooks in there, there's a whole depiction of the, the ceremony of becoming uh, a shellback, the first time someone gets on the equator. They, anybody who has not been a shellback has to go through an initiation. And so uh, that was a real interesting trip because there, anyone, including officers, have to go through this very humiliating uh, case where we had to walk around that deck that we just came in on our hands and knees in our underwear uh, as part of the initiation. We had to pluck a maraschino cherry out of the fattest chief's belly button that I ever saw. That was a fun thing to do. <laughs> Gross, probably today wouldn't be politically correct, but we had to do that. And uh, we had to, to wallow around in a whole bunch of ship's garbage. Uh, that's, a, that's another part of it. So officers and uh, men alike, we became shellbacks together. Uh, Jim, talk to us a little bit about what happened when the ship was ready to be decommissioned. What happened? What did you do? Well, um, as you well know from the history, uh, why would even decommissioning happen? Basically, it was the it was uh, McNamara's decision to uh, cut the Defense Department budget and wind down because this ship and others like this was causing uh, costing a lot of money, and I can't remember what it was. It's, I heard about a million dollars a day. So uh, this was in uh, late 69, uh, and the ship had already uh, served its purpose, which was, I believe, to go over and shoot at the Ho Chi Minh Trail and provide uh, uh, support for those uh, Army and Marine units that were over there. So uh, some, it was a political decision to, to slow down, and therefore the ships like this were put out of commission. And the ship then went to, uh, from Vietnam to Hawaii for a few days, and then on to Bremerton, Washington. Uh, I believe, uh, no, we went back to the home port with Long Beach, California, after Vietnam. And then from Long Beach, we took it up to Bremerton, Washington, for the decommissioning of the ship. And that's at uh, Puget Town Naval Shipyard in Bremerton in uh, December of, uh, was it, 69. And so that... Uh, all aboard that that was probably the one of the most that was a gloomy time because as we were aboard the ship and as everybody would leave it's kind of like um, people leaving a party you know and uh, what you have left over is a bunch of people looking around and your family's gone a few just core people were there it was a it was a tough time um, it was a tough time because we had to do things uh, as corpsmen that we really didn't want to do. A part of it was having details to go down into the bowels of the ship and clean up the uh, um, oil and the water that had been down there uh, so that when the ship was put in mothballs that none of this would, would cause problems. And that was really a pretty tough detail. I uh, Even just right outside the sick bay, if you go down three decks into the in between the first shell and the outer shell of the ship, uh, I think you'll get more likely what it's to be entombed. It's, it's a very spooky and, 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 and uh, an unpleasant feeling, but we had to do that. Uh, but I think probably the most, the worst thing was to, to have, you were close with guys for 13 months, and then next thing you know, the, these guys were gone to other, uh, other duties and other, uh, other assignments. Uh, I was left behind as the decommissioning detail as I showed you the book before, uh, and that decommissioning, the, the process is, it takes a, a few months to get to the point where men start to leave the ship, and at the last point, it's even worse, because they take you and put you on a, a, um, a, a barge, it's a, uh, it's a barracks barge, and it's probably one of the most disgusting 
things you could live in on a berry barge in the winter in Puget Sound. Cold, damp, uh, uh, creaky, and that last month I think was almost unbearable. We were all just wanted to get the heck out of there because it, uh, not, not just for the physical part of it, but all the emotional uh, uh, detachments that we had to make up until that point. And after that, I went aboard the USS Klondike AR-22 in San Diego, California. And the Klondike was what type of ship? It was a, it was a repair ship. Uh, that's a history in itself of how I got aboard the repair ship because I had a, quite a bit of time. They wanted to send me to Camp Pendleton for Fleet Marine and uh, back over to Vietnam for another back-to-back -back duty. Uh, Fortunately, I happened to have an acquaintance who, a, a military acquaintance who knew the uh, chief of personnel at the, uh, down in San Diego. And I, I called him up and asked him if there was another ship available. Uh, he says, you know, you have su such a stellar record. I don't have any line ship available. And unfortunately, you're going to have to go to fleet marine training. And so I was, this, you know, resigned to go in two more months, go to Fleet Marine, and then another, uh, what was it, how many Fleet Marines, what, eight weeks, and then back over to pound the ground with the Marines, which I would have done. Uh, but at the last moment, the day before I left that creaky old disgusting barge, he called and left a message, and I called back uh, to him, and he said, I've got this repair ship that can't even get out of the dock. It's a disgusting duty. Do you want it? And... Uh, Frankly, I had enough of Vietnam, and I took the duty. That's how I got aboard the AR-22. But when I got down to the AR-22, uh, a big Master Chief Petty Officer came aboard the ship and said, what in the holy hell are you doing aboard this ship? I looked at your record. Somebody made a mistake. Who did it? Tell me who did it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have their ass. Said, I said, you, you just don't belong aboard the ship. And then I told him what I really wanted to do. And he said, well, I'm going to send you to OCS. You're going to Officer's Candidate School. I said, Chief, really, I, I don't want to. Do you can, you're going to be an MS medical service officer. And he says, for sure, you've got it aboard. I'm going to get you out of here. Two months' time, you're going to go. But you have to sign up for six years. <laughs> I said, you really, Chief, I got drafted out of, uh, out of college. I got to go back. And kind of that, that would segue. Of, I went back into college. Actually, I got accepted to Purdue University, one of the prestigious pharmacy schools at the time. And so I went to Purdue University Pharmacy School, uh, became a pharmacist, and then went on to graduate school and got my doctorate in pharmaceutics, where I'm a, re a research scientist. I develop drug products. And from then on, I worked at major drug companies and then started a couple of companies myself. And I'm, a, I'm an inventor, a, an author, a scientist, and that's, that's who I am today as a pharmacist and a PhD pharmaceutics guy. So would that describe the impact that the ship had on your life there the, or any other thing? Yeah, I think, I think the impact uh, that the ship had on my life is that y you heard, I guess, what the effectual was. But what started it, you know, it's a call to duty. I, I think I explained this to you before that most of the guys felt a call to duty. The guys that when I went to boot camp at Great Lakes Naval Training Center, three fourths of those guys had college degrees as enlisted men. They were digging the bottom and there was no draft numbers at the time. This was quota. If you happen to be the poor sap in one of the areas where they already ran out of their quota, then they went in and drafted you out of college. So most people think, did you get a deferment? Oh yeah, I had a deferment. For one, they came in and says, no, you don't have a deferment anymore. So most of those guys got drafted out of college or were, were gra recent graduates. The call to arms, pe these guys were patriots. And from that, we did what we had to do. That was the, that was the start. The ship had an impact on me as it was a good thing to mature me to strengthen my resolve to what I wanted to do in my life. Because here you are doing a tough job in a, in a war zone, not knowing what's going to happen, being with guys of their, of their similar ilk, and also the guys that were, were I thought were, were top-notch people anyway. And all of that experience matured me, because I was only a 19-year-old boy, but matured me, but strengthened my resolve to what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I would not have the strength or the resolve, I believe, initially to go on 
to this torturous path of 12 years of college to become a PhD if I didn't really have this experience. Personally, it's given me a, 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 a cut on discipline of life, mental discipline, physical discipline. I think it's you'll never, uh, you know, you, you, it's an invaluable experience. That experience helps you in all aspects of your life, whether it would be your your, your interactions with people, your daily life, your religious life, or whatever. I think it was a major impact on how I perceived myself in this life and caused me to go on. So that's how it impacted me. Um, this was a good experience. This was not a bad experience. This was a necessary experience as I look back on it from 30 years ago. One other question we talked about during a break and we might want to bring up, when the ship was firing, you talked a little bit about the physical effects on you and a little bit about the impact of the concussion down in this area, in the medical area. Could you yeah. discuss that for a minute or two? Well, you know, as, as it is in laws of physics, you know, the ship is actually on a pendulum. So the higher you're up, the further that you impacted. What we are is, is down below decks. So the impact of at here at sick bay was just like this. It, 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 this is a one-gun salvo two-gun salvo, three-gun salvo, nine-gun salvo, it's, it really rocks you back and forth. So you know you're in a nine-gun salvo here. If you're up higher, you really know you're in a nine-gun salvo. If you're down lower, you might not feel it as much. If you're out on deck, you know, there was, you could not, uh, it was forbidden to get too close to the guns because of the vacuum that that caused when that shell shot out of that, those big guns. This is a tremendous force. What is it, about 660 pounds? Is that right? I've forgotten. What do you mean? Uh, of, of powder. And it was, it was huge. And but when you get a nine-gun salvo, the, the vacuum pulls on your skin. And if you get too close, it pops your eyeballs. It'll pop the small, small blood vessels in your eyes. So it really is, and it could pop your eardrums. It, 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 it could kill you if you're very close to it. And so you really can't get too close to these guns, especially in a three-gun salvo. That would be the physical impact of somebody getting too close to the guns as they fired. So you weren't allowed to get that close to the guns. But, the, but it, was, it was loud. Even when you're close enough to observe, you, know, you have to put your fingers in your ears because it's a, it's a loud roar. What was the impact down below here in the medical area when the guns were fired? It was mostly when the uh, when a single gun they would they would fire one and two guns because mostly precision five inch guns you know the the mostly that was on the side which they had they fired I don't know how many thousands of rounds of five inch guns uh, but the five inch guns you would you would just hear boom 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 I mean just kind of like the the walls a little bit uh, uh, if they were firing forward turrets which right here physically in the sick bay, you're right down there by number two, number one turrets up there. If you were uh, uh, here when they were firing one, it would be whoom, you know, it would, it would be sounding just like that and you would have a, and, and, the, and the ship bulkhead would just rattle, whoom, whoom. And if you would fire the nine gun salvos or three gun salvos, the ship movement would, you would feel that very, uh, uh, very much. But as we were firing, we were usually not setting still. We were actually, sh going through the water. So uh, the, the, it would rattle you, but you got so used to it that it didn't bother you. But I do remember, I recall one time when we were at, out at sea for 60 days and we were, we were actually um, training after a training and we went through a couple general quarters uh, uh, for real, I can't remember. I w we were so tired, you know, ship life gets you really tired. I could just lay right here on this deck and, and go to sleep. Actually, you know, I'm surprised. This looks like the same tile that we had in Vietnam. This is a green tile. We could have had, we could have had some gray, but I, I don't know if this is how, when they put this in there anyway. So uh, this tile looks very much like what we had um, um, uh, in uh, Vietnam. Yeah. But I remember in, up in the sleeping quarters, it was gray tile. And I, I, I've been so tired I could just sit there and sleep and thought this was a feather bed. I was so tired. I slept in the, uh, by the way, I slept uh, three high in, in a rack of, uh, of bunks. I was the number three guy at the top, right, right as I was looking into a steam pipe or something. I don't know. Now, Mr. Uh, Andy Wager, any uh, questions you might like to ask at this point? No, I, I think he's covered the uh, material extremely well. I, I have to come and tell him he's got good recollection. Yeah. I'm having a little, I have a little trouble, but he brought yeah. back a lot to me. 
Is there anything, oh, yeah. Jim, that you want to say that I didn't ask about throughout the whole interview so far? Um, you know, I, I, I tried to think of, you know, something philosophical to say, but I think most of it is just from the heart that, yes, this, this ship life impacted me. Uh, four years of a guy's life is uh, not trivial. Uh, it's important. And uh, we shouldn't ever forget the, the, the service of anyone. It's, it's somebody's life changed for the service of a country. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's very important. Uh, I appreciate that more as I get older of how, this, how the service of all people who give service to our country and what valuable, uh, what, what valuable duty they're performing. It's a call to duty. Those men who call to duty and have a clean heart should be commended. It's, it's really uh, all I want to say. I, have, I probably think of a thousand other anecdotes, Tom, I could think of. Uh, but as my memory uh, starts to, to come back, um, I do remember, uh, you know, general quarters. When you general quarters, you go, you know, how you can't go the wrong way in general quarters. And how, how, how sometimes you have to do general quarters when it's dark. So you really have to know your way around the ship. Um, those vivid memories, though, I hope I brought back into uh, some of the good ones, you know, and on the equator, the, the, the Bob Hope Christmas show, some of the, some of the bad ones. Uh, it was never humdrum. Time, time marches on, though, when you're constantly firing, firing, firing. It takes its, uh, it's somehow, you know, you're not doing the firing, but that constant barrage of firing and the movement of the ship makes you so tired. I think physically, it, even I was a young guy. I don't know how the older guys did it. And we had boats and mates, you know, in their uh, 50s. They, I don't know how in the world they did it, or f late 40s perhaps. Uh, sad time, guy having a heart attack, and uh, we had to go down and put him in a body bag who was having lunch at the time. That's sad because, um, you know, guy's, guy's life ended here uh, on a ship at, at a relatively young age. He wasn't an old man. Um,